researcher in Qatar Computer Research Institute. So this session, we have three papers. The first one is about uh, DPSense, differentially private cross, cross world spectrum sensing. And uh, uh, Xiao Tong Jin from uh, Arizona State University to give the talk. OK. So thank you for the chair's introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. It is my great pleasure to present our paper, DP Sense, Differentially Private Crowdsourced Spectrum Sensing. And this is a joint work with uh, my colleagues, Ray Zhang, Yimin Chen, Tao Li, and my PhD advisor, Dr. Yan Chao Zhang. We are from Arizona State University and the University of Delaware in the United States. So in the past decade, we have witnessed the exponential growth in data traffic and also the spectrum demand. As Cisco forecasted, the global mobile data traffic will grow from 2.5 exabytes per month in 2014 to 24.3 exabytes per month in 2019. That's nearly a tenfold increase in five years. On the other hand, according to FCC, we faced a spectrum shortage of 275 megahertz in 2014, and this shortage can only grow this year and in the years to follow. So shared spectrum access is becoming one of the key paradigms to alleviate the spectrum shortage. And in this framework, we have the spectrum database provider, short as SSP, coordinating and providing uh, the shared spectrum access to multiple, property, uh, multiple parties. So here, the multiple parties are referred to as the secondary users, short as SU. So the basic idea is that whenever the SSP knows some spectrum is vacated for utilization based on the spectrum availability information, then he can dynamically assign those spectrums to the unlicensed parties for the short-term usage. And currently, the spectrum availability information can be obtained in several means. The first one is that we can actually conduct theoretical inference. So in this method, we actually perform some theoret theoretical calculation using some signal propagation models to calculate the boundaries of the transmission. But actually, that has some drawbacks because, uh, first of all, the signal propagation propagation model is not accurate. And secondly, their uh, computation is rather conservative. So uh, people then later refer to spectrum sensing to a better solution. And basically, we have two sub-solutions as well. The first one is either we can uh, deploy dedicated sensors to the field. Also, we can uh, recruit crowdsourced mobile users to perform real-time spectrum sensing. But for the first method, dedicated sensors, their uh, deployment cost and also the maintenance cost will be high. So it could be prohibitive sometimes. So maybe the second paradigm, the crowdsourced mobile users would be more favored. And uh, our work, uh, focuses main, mainly on the second paradigm, the crowdsourced mobile users part. So here's an overview of the crowdsourced spectrum sensing, short as CSS system. And in this system, we have the spectrum service provider, SSP, that utilizes the mobile crowdsourcing to estimate the spectrum availability and answers the spectrum access requests from SUs. So the SSP generates the spectrum tasks either periodically or on demand. And the mobile participants are the users carrying advanced mobile devices with spectrum sensing capabilities. They are also willing to travel some distances in order to gain some monetary rewards or reputation and so on for the, in, in the system. So we define the cost for this paradigm as the follows. Uh, the, tot the cost is the total travel distances for all the participating users who accept the task and perform the task. 
clearly we can see there are some conflict between the privacy and the efficiency. So the SSP wants to know the locations of all the candidate location of participants to reduce the total cost so that there, um, they can assign participants to the nearest locations to perform sensing tasks. However, the mobile users are reluctant to disclose their locations. And here we illustrate several potential uh, location privacy issues. It is obvious to see that um, in order to protect the user's locations, no exact locations can be known by the SSP. So then we can consider two strategies on the participant's point of view. Uh, but unfortunately, we will see that these two strategies fail to protect the user's locations. Uh, user location privacy. So one plausible solution is that maybe we can ask the service provider SSP simply broadcast uh, all the available sensing tasks and uh, let the participants claim tasks without disclosing their locations to the SSP. Um, but this actually can be, since mobile participants tend to select their sensing tasks closest to their locations, then the SSP could still infer their locations based on the tasks they choose. For example, here we have three sensing tasks available, TA to TC, and uh, the participant, the victim, actually chooses TB. So it is very likely that the victim is located in the highlighted region. So maybe we can try another strategy. We can let the participants submit perturbed locations to the SSP, for example, using some uh, cloaking regions or top K locations and so on, uh, use, using those locations uh, mechanisms. And uh, the SSP can then, in turn, assign the sensing tasks based on the perturbed locations. However, based on a recent study, uh, actually it was published in last year's CCS, the SSP can still infer the participant location by exploring the temporal correlation among the multiple perturbed locations submitted within a short time period. For example, let's look at the example here. Uh, we can see there are three cloaking regions submitted by a certain participant. So the SSP can, uh, by jointly considering the traffic conditions and also the order of appearances of those cloaking regions, he might be able to infer that the participant is, was originally in, uh, at a restaurant in the TA region and uh, in the final phase moved to a, the grocery store in the TC region. So the two exemplary attacks discussed above highlight the risk of location privacy breach in the CSS and call for an advanced solution to protect the mobile participant's location privacy. So we have the following design objectives uh, for our system. First of all, we want to achieve differential location privacy. That is, the mobile participant's location privacy is well protected. And secondly, we want to achieve minimal travel distance so uh, the spectrum sensing tasks are assigned to mobile participants based on perturbed location traces while ensuring the minimal total travel cost. And lastly, we want to achieve high task completion rate. So each spectrum sensing task can be successfully conducted with overwhelming probability. And this is how a uh, DPSense system looks like. So first of all, uh, the SSP will broadcast all the upcoming um, sensing tasks for a, a time window. And then the mobile participants will uh, generate, will predict their future mobility traces and input them uh, into the sensing devices. So the sensing devices will then generate the perturbed mobility traces based on their input and then upload those perturbed locations, location traces to the service provider, SSP. And with the knowledge of the perturbed location traces, then the SSP will be able to assign those participants to uh, some uh, sensing locations to perform real-time spectrum sensing. 
So then we are ready to talk about the spectrum sensing model in our framework. Um, for the spectrum sensing, we have mainly two parties. The first one is PU. PU actually refers to the primary user who is the owner of the spectrum uh, or wireless band. So the mobile participants here mainly want to sense the existence of their PU transmissions to identify whether they simply uh, are carrying on their transmission or not. So we assume the, the, the channel between the PU and the mobile participant is a AWGN channel with relay fading. But actually, our system doesn't depend on the specific channel. It just facilitates our theoretical analysis. And also, we assume that each participant, the participants are separated with each other by a distance of at least D0. So this D0 actually uh, is related to the diversity gain we defined in our system. So the diversity gain refers to the number of mobile participants, each with at least a D0 distance from each other. For example, in this um, figure I show here, we have a device diversity gain of two. And, and normally, this, for one sensing task, we actually have to achieve a diversity gain, for example, like four or five. Uh, that is to ensure that the sensing results are accurate enough. So here we show how we formulate the spectrum sensing task in the spatial domain. We can see there are two sensing tasks available in the, in the figure, and the regions of which are identified using the circles. Then the center of each is determined by the locations of the SUs who want to transmit at that location. And within the sensing region, there are multiple candidate sensing locations marked by the stars. So those sensing locations will be the locations where um, the mobile participants will later travel to, the, to those uh, locations. And uh, each location actually, actually corresponds to a subtask we define in our system. So we assume that the locations are uh, spe specified beforehand by the SSP, and the criteria of selection are basically to select those locations where multipass or shadow fading are less likely to occur, um, so that the sensing results can be more accurate and reliable. So here we show how we formulate the spe spectrum sensing task in a timing domain. Um, each task is specified to be completed within a time window. So for our case, we assume that the time period is generally very short, so that the participants assigned to, us, to the same sensing task, we have to perform the spectrum sensing at almost the same time. This is to ensure the diversity gain we uh, define in our system. And uh, if participants simply arrive at different time, then there will actually be no diversity gain. So our scheme directly builds upon uh, the differential location privacy system proposed in last year's CCS. And here we review some basic concepts in that work and some other work that are related to our solution. We first adopt the Markov model to represent the temporal correlations among the submitted locations of a particular CSS particip participant. So from the SSP's point of view, since it can only observe the perturbed mobility trace, then the inference model is actually a hidden Markov model, uh, HMM. HMM. So uh, for example, in the figure we show here, X1 to X3 are the true locations, while Y1 to Y4 are the perturbed locations. Then we review the concept of the differential privacy. So the differential privacy essentially provides the following guarantee. By perturbing one entry of the input data set, the probability distribution of the outcomes generated by the, a certain mechanism is indistinguishable to any adversary. So this ensures that the data privacy of each individual item of the input data set is well protected. 
Then um, the authors in the referenced work uh, in last year's CCS proposed uh, the notion of differential location privacy. So first of all, a data location set is defined. So the data location set actually is a, a set of locations um, that indicates the most probable locations of a certain participant based on the transition probability that we introduced in the previously mentioned hidden Markov model. And with the probability sum of those locations being no less than one minus delta. delta. And correspondingly, with the definition of delta location set, then we can move forward to define the differential location privacy. So it's, sim it's simply a variation of the traditional uh, definition of the differential location, uh, dif differential privacy, sorry. So um, here we will summarize the basic steps to generate a differentially private mobility trace. And the input to the system is the true mobility trace, while the output is a perturbed mobility trace satisfying the differential privacy on the delta location set. So basically, it consists of three steps. The first one is we derive the convex hull of the possible location set delta x. Then we generate the sensitivity hull. And last step is to sample a point in the isotropic plane uh, with the transformation of the sensitivity hall. So after this, the SSP only knows the perturbed mobility traces. That means the location privacy of mobile participants is now protected. But the SSP needs to use the location information to assign tasks. And so how can he make sure that the utility of those traces are good enough? I mean, sometimes the added noise can be very large so that the participant might be very unlikely to travel to those sensing locations. And therefore, we further propose to use a trace smoothing module. So the input of the trace smoothing module is the perturbed mobility trace, while the output is the smooth mobility trace. And essentially, it's based on the simple uh, sliding window technique. So basically, we um, average the coordinates among the neighboring timestamps in order to generate the current coordinates for the current timestamp. Then we will talk about how we formulate the, uh, how, how, how the, um, the uh, I'm sorry, uh, how to formulate the participant to accept or decline the task assignment. And uh, first of all, I would like to present the timing constraint for fulfilling this task. So um, for each spectrum task, sensing task, actually there is a deadline. So that means the participant really need to um, be at the sensing location before the specified timeline in order to perform a valid spectrum sensing. So then we propose the notion of synthetic distance. It basically jointly considers the travel distance and also the waiting time if the participant manages to arrive earlier than the deadline. Lastly, then we will model the probability of acceptance of a certain task, basically using a linear model here. So uh, essentially, we, we, in our model, we say that the participant is very likely to perform a certain spectrum sensing task if his location is very close to the sensing location. And while the uh, probability will degrade to zero if the distance becomes larger than MTD. So MTD here is a system parameter. It's, it refers to the maximum total travel distance cost. So then we will uh, show the spectrum sensing task assignment formulation. The overall objective is to achieve the minimum uh, spectrum sensing cost in terms of the travel cost, the sum of the travel cost, while subject to the following constraints. The first one is the diversity constraint. So for each sensing task, we, we have to make sure that we have enough participants on the field to perform spectrum sensing 
at different locations so that the diversity requirement can be met. And the second constraint is that we want each subtask can be at most fulfilled by one user. So in other words, if we uh, assign multiple users to the same subtask, as mentioned before, there is no additional diver diversity gain. So we will not allow uh, this happening. And uh, thirdly, we want to ensure that one user can only perform one subtask in this round. So actually, this can be extended, for example, in the future, uh, that we can allow the user to perform multiple spectrum sensing subtask. Uh, but uh, for, the, for the current stage, we only allow, we actually have to impose this constraint. So the last one is the time constraint. And in our paper, we demonstrated that uh, the integer programming problem is MP hard, and so we propose a heuristic solution. So the intuition of the solution is that we sequentially assign every subtask a one sensing task to each participant with the smallest synthetic travel distance. And here, the total diversity order exceeds the required threshold. So, uh, once the assignment results are known to the participants, the participants have the right or freedom to either reject or accept the sensing task. So if participants accept the sensing task, they need to make sure that they can really perform the task in time. And how can we make sure this happens or works, well, works well? We have to rely on a reputation system. So the reputation system works like this. First of all, we decrease the reputation for the users with failed tasks. For example, uh, he uh, just arrived late or didn't um, submit the sensing data at all. And correspondingly, then we will actually um, will, um, um, give discounted payment for those users with a low reputation. And lastly, during the task assignment phase, we will also consider discounted diversity gain for those users with low reputation. So here's the data set we used in our evaluation. Um, it consists of uh, mobility traces of multiple taxis uh, collected in Rome, Italy. And we extracted the mobility traces in the center area of the Rome city as illustrated in the left figure. And on the right figure, we show the distribution of the mobility traces as well. So generally, it's pretty dense in the center area of the city, well, uh, pretty coarse um, in the sparse, in the outer corners. So first, we evaluate the differential location privacy aspect of our system. Uh, we can see that with epsilon increases, the PIM trace will be more close to, will be closer to the original trace. That means actually the differential location privacy aspect is degraded. And correspondingly, we measure the distance error of those two traces. And we can similarly draw uh, a similar conclusion. So essentially, when epsilon uh, increases, actually the distance error will decrease. And here is the data exercise. So recall that the data, ex the data location set refers to all the possible locations that a, a certain participant will be likely located at. So when data exercise decreases, then we can say um, the number of locations for the participant to hide in those locations will be decreased. And so this is what we can see with the value when epsilon increases. And then we will see um, the smoothing effectiveness. So we can see actually um, the smoothing module enables uh, the reduction of the distance error between the two mobility traces. And this actually directly impacts our system performance in terms of the minimal travel distance. We can see uh, the TDD actually refers to the total travel distance. So here, um, our system is somewhere between the uh, original mobility trace and also the worst case defined in our system. 
And the lastly, we evaluate the high task, we evaluate the high task completion rate aspect of our system. So um, you can see when beta increases to 1.6, the TCR, the TCR refers to the task completion rate, is almost identical to the original system value. And the beta here is a system parameter, actually I showed pre previously in the task formulation model. So it's used to indicate the importance of the SSP that he can achieve the desired, desired uh, diversity order for each sensing task. So lastly, we will summarize the related work. Um, currently, there are mainly three, uh, five aspects of the different related work. So for the first one, it's the general location privacy preserving mechanisms. And secondly, we have the location privacy protection in CSS systems. And then we have the location privacy protection in general crowdsourced mobile uh, sensing systems. And uh, we also have the task assignment in spatial crowdsourcing without the consideration of location privacy, et cetera. And lastly, we have the differential privacy. And uniqueness of our paper is that, first of all, we have a different uh, adversary model, and we also have a different task formulation. And lastly, we have a different uh, design objectives. So all these factors actually lead to a completely different solution of our systems. So to conclude, DPSense allows the SSP to select mobile users without violating the location privacy of mobile users. And uh, DPSense simultaneously achieve the three design goals that we target. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for attention. Any questions? Questions? Okay. So uh, in, in earlier slides, you mentioned that to make the system work, you need to have a prediction of the user's mobility. Yes. In other words, I need to know where I'm going to be in the future. So how realistic this assumption is? So yes, this is a good question. Thank you. So um, generally speaking, uh, the participant only needs to make a very coarse estimation. And if the estimation is sometimes wrong, because sometimes he changes his, his plans, or he simply out of the concern of privacy, he simply doesn't want to submit the true location mobility trace, then he can use a arbitrary mobility trace. But in that case, since the task assignment is based on his submitted mobility trace, even it's a perturbed version, so if the task in the final round is assigned to the, the participant, then the participant still has to make sure that he can uh, perform those sensing tasks in time. Uh, and uh, we uh, ensure this works by adopting the reputation system we mentioned here. So, okay. uh, more questions? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, how, far, uh, how far do you rely on the mobility so, um, to uh, achieve privacy? So what, what happens if an node is fixed or it doesn't move for quite some time? Uh, do you still guarantee privacy then, or what happens then? OK, so your question is, um, does our system rely on the, the speed, or the performance of our system depends on the specific speed of the, mobility of the participant? It, OK, so actually, it doesn't really depend. Um, depend on that because, so first of all, in our system, uh, the data trace, the data set actually consists of mobility traces of, the, of the, those taxis, and those taxis sometimes would travel at a speed of like 30 kilometers per hour, and sometimes would be around five kilometers per hour when they are just waiting for uh, passengers and so on. So, um, so in other words, our system can perform relatively well independent of the speed of those mobile, uh, of those participants. And on the other hand, um, since the location privacy guarantee is 
insured for each timestamp. So um, as long as, I would say as long as um, there is some movement, then the performance will be guaranteed as well. And in a, lastly, I want to say that since our scheme can actually uh, adopt other location, differentially location private mechanisms um, to, uh, to ensure the same performance. So in other words, we don't specifically rely on the um, location privacy mechanism that, it, that was proposed in last year's CCS, but we just show the possibility of this work by adopting that framework. So that's in my answer. Thank you. All right. Let's thank the speaker again. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, our